Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to this uh, lecture on organometallics chemistry. Today's topic is very interesting one. It is about reactivity of organometallic compounds. Now, reactivity is something which or distinguishes organometallic compounds from other compounds because they are extremely reactive with air and moistures and they often are synthesized in the exclusion of air and moisture. They are extremely unstable under ordinary uh, aerobic conditions. So, a uh, detailed know-how is required in handling this compound. Now, in the beginning, it was thought that the extreme reactivity of organometallic compounds are probably of thermodynamic origin. That is, they are unstable compounds and that they tend to uh, degrade quickly. But later it was found that they are, <coughs> uh, their degradation is not due to thermodynamic instability or rather of kinetic origin. And that can be gauged by looking at the bond energy of organometallic compounds. The bond energy of the organometallic, organometallic compounds depends on the strength of the metal carbon bonds. And <coughs> And metal carbon bonds, <coughs> uh, bonds are sort of weaker than that of the metal oxygen, metal nitrogen or metal halide or metal other metal uh, heteroatom bonds. Now, uh, furthermore it was seen that when you have a multiple ligand attached to metal that their bond dissociation energy may not uh, directly correlate a, for each bond dissociation. For example, for uh, <coughs> dimethyl mercury, the first bond dissociation of methyl mercury methyl bond is about 214 kilojoule per mole. And the second bond dissociation of mercury methyl is much lower about 29 kilojoule per mole. So, what it tells that the two bonds of mercury as they dissociate as they dissociate by themselves, their bond dissociation energy uh, uh, varies and that depends on the intermediate species uh, which is formed after the dissociation of the first bond. Thus, in overall, the LNM C X 3 where we have a, a metal and then the ligand substituents on the metal and we have X substituents on the carbon. Its bond dissociation energy energy or this is uh, commonly referred to as BDE depends on the oxygen state of the metal which is this ligand environment around metal which is 
this, then nature of x which is this and in addition to all of these overall steric and electronic effect which is kind of very interesting that and electronic effect. This overall steric and electronic effect arise because of the presence of the uh, uh, substituents L n and x and their mutual interaction among each other. So, all of these uh, all of these uh, influences the bond dissociation energy influences the bond dissociation energy of the metal x bond and that is why uh, it becomes very interesting. Now, let us take a look at this bond dissociation energy and sort of classify them where uh, how the bond stands. For example, uh, this bond uh, metal carbon bond energy can vary a wide range. It covers wide range let us say for BME 3 and arsenic ME 3 and bismuth ME 3 the metal carbon bond dissociation energy in kilojoules per mole stands at 365 to arsenic this is much lower in the periodic table uh, to 229 to this one being the lowest as 141 kilojoules per mole. And what it signifies that 365 this to be a very strong bond, strong bond this being medium, this being a weak bond. So, the range in which a covalent metal carbon bond arises can vary a lot from being very strong to very weak and for non metals that depends on the location of the metal in its periodic table. Now, for the other kinds of bonds which are mainly ionic bonds, for ionic bonds the bond this is, uh, uh, energy a, a depends on the type of the metal and the metal has to be electropositive one when the M is electropositive. So, these are mainly alkali metals. And the ligand has to be a carbon ion, ligand has to be a stable carbon ion. So, examples of this include various ionic compounds. For example, we have so here we see a very electropositive uh, alkali metal. and here is a, a stable carbon ion. Structure of this anion 
is this uh, conjugated uh, uh, cyclopentadienyl anion which is very stable. Similarly, if we take a look at uh, other ionic compounds for example, potassium C P P H 3 minus here the metal is again a uh, electropositive metal potassium alkali metal and anion also is a, a stable carbon ion. So, the carbon negative charge on the carbon is stabilized over 3 phenyl rings. So, what we see that uh, for uh, ionic compounds the metal has to be a electropositive ion and the anion a stable one. Another example is the sodium acetylide where uh, this uh, sodium is again a uh, electropositive metal and this acetylide moiety is also a stable carbon ion where the anion is stabilized over a sp carbon ion uh, carbon atom. So, there are cases where uh, multi center non classical bonds are formed. These M C bonds bonds generally forms of atoms like boron, electron deficient atoms like borons, uh, aluminiums and these are generally referred to as electron deficient bonds. Uh, or non classical bonds. Because they do not follow the uh, conventional view of uh, two bond to uh, two, two centered two electron covalent bonds. Now, in this case where non classical bonds are formed, multi center non classical bonds are formed, the uh, valence shell of L is usually less than half filled M valence shell is less than half filled. and M is a polarizing strongly polarizing uh, cation is strongly polarizing due to high charged to radius ratio. So, that means that these cations are very small and hence we see the examples of this class includes methyl lithium dimethyl beryllium trimethyl aluminum which is a dimer as opposed to potassium 2 n H n plus 2 n plus 1 anion. Now, what we see over here that except for potassium which is large other metals are very small. they are very small and hence the cations which are polarizable they have half less than half filled they conveniently form multi center uh, bonds. So, all of these forms multi center bonds 
electron deficient bonds. Whereas, when the metal is large and it is not as polarizable as the other one, then this is uh, forming ionic bonds. So, what we see is that depending on the size and the polarizable ability, polarizability of the cation, the organometallic compound can uh, have non-classical electron deficient multicenter bonds or it can also be truly ionic ones and hence the reactivity of this species would also vary accordingly. Now, another important concept involving organometallic compounds is its 18 valence electron rule. So, this is an important rule that says that transition metal complexes one which are stable ones should have 18 electron in its valence orbitals. And this rule have often been used conveniently in stating that certain compounds could be prepared because they would meet the 18 valence electron rules and sometimes erroneously it is said that compounds which cannot have 18 valence electron rule would be unstable and hence uh, cannot uh, be prepared or dealt with. However, as uh, a lot of organometallic compounds were synthesized and their structures and interactions were looked into, then it was found that there are compounds which obey 18 valence electron rules and there are compounds which does not obey 18 uh, valence electron rule. So, first of all we would take a look at 18 valence electron rule and see a, what are the uh, compounds which obey them and when the 18 valence electron rule is not obeyed. And gradually we move on to the classification based of this kind of organometallic compounds. And usually it is found that there are three types of compounds class 1, class 2 and class 3. So, let us see and analyze what is 18 valence electron rule and what are the different classes of 18 valence electron rule that uh, we just has described. Now, in order to understand the origin of 18 valence electron rule, we should understand what, the, uh, what, uh, what leads uh, to the concept of 18 valence electron rule. And that stems from the fact that the, uh, this rule is primarily applicable for transition metal complexes. The reason being that transition metal complexes have d orbital which leads to larger number of valence electron. For example, a main group element uses only n s and n p orbitals for bond, uh, chemical bonding. for bonding. So, the number of orbitals used is n s has one orbital and n p has three orbital leading to four valence orbital which can have eight valence electron. So, main group elements primarily would follow that 8, eight electron rule for its stability. 
Similarly, for transition metals, they have inner d orbitals. They use n minus 1 d n s and n p orbitals for bonding. So, it has providing 5 orbitals n s providing 1 orbital and n p providing 3 orbital giving a total of 9 orbitals which can accommodate 18 valence electrons. Now, the question arises that uh, for a transition metal complexes are all these 9 or orbitals fully occupied or not. Now, it turns out that these orbital need not be fully occupied and they can be partially uh, filled, can be partially or fully occupied. Now, this is a very interesting concept, the concept of partial occupancy of this orbital, because if it is these orbitals are partially occupied, then they can accept electron and if it is fully as well as they can donate electron. And this is a unique characteristics of the a transition metals which has d orbitals. And this partial occupancy gives rise to very interesting interaction that manifest uh, when it binds to the ligand in the form of sigma donation as well as pi accept, uh, acceptance synergism. The partial occupancy to sigma donation and pi acceptance synergism. So, this sigma donation and pi acceptance gives rise to various uh, reactivity attributes. For example, this partial occupancy leading to sigma donation or pi acceptance can give rise to variation in coordination number coordination number and in terms of reactivity what it means that as the coordination uh, number is changed or variation of it is allowed then the metal compound can show chemoselectivity manifests into chemoselectivity. Regioselectivity and stereoselectivity. So, this is indeed a wonderful uh, uh, reactivity pattern that arises out of this uh, or variability in coordination number of transition metal and which in turn arises from sigma uh, uh, on its ability to undergo sigma uh, donation and pi acceptance 
since property of its orbital, uh, the valence uh, orbital. So, what uh, uh, we came uh, to know today is that that there is a significant amount of uh, interactions which arises due to partial occupancy of the metal d orbital and this leads to such kind of uh, sigma bonding and pi bonding. Now, sigma donation of metal, let us say we have a metal carbon bond, it can have an uh, interactions like sigma interactions as well as pi interactions. The sigma interaction is usually from ligand to metal. And where, whereas the pi interaction usually called back donation occurs between metal to ligand. So, what does that mean that the ligand orbital in sigma interaction ligand orbital is filled and metal orbital is empty. Whereas, in pi interaction the metal orbital is filled and ligand orbital is empty. So, what happens over here is two opposing uh, uh, electron donation that happens uh, between the metal and the carbon in the first one is the sigma interaction where uh, a filled uh, ligand orbital donates its all this electron to the metal and in return the metal gets equal electron rich and through its pi back donation orbital a uh, filled metal orbital then donates onto the vacant uh, ligand uh, orbital. And these two forward donation and backward donation are symbiotic in nature, they sort of reinforce each other as a result they uh, uh, make the bond all the more stronger. I must say that this sigma donation and pi back, uh, back donation synergy is a feature which is interaction uh, unique to transition metal complexes and hence something which is unique to organometallic chemistry. Usually such uh, sigma donation and pi back donation are rare for non metals as well as for alkali and alkaline alk metal. So, these makes transition metal complexes unique and as well as uh, they uh, 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 have they uh, as well as they exhibit several properties in various uh, important transformations. So, with this I would uh, briefly uh, summarize today's uh, the highlights of today's lectures in which we have looked into the reactivity, we have also looked into the metal ligand interaction, we have looked into uh, the directions in which uh, uh, the, uh, the electrons flow from the metal to the ligand and the ligand to the metal. And uh, we have also looked at the reasons which leads to such synergi synergism that happens between uh, metal uh, 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 ligand interaction leading to sigma donation and pi do back donation. Now, with this foundation in place, we are going to take a look at uh, uh, another important uh, principles that in the next lecture that is about the compounds or classification of the compound based on the 18 valence electron rules that we have learned today. We have also learned the uh, origin of this 18 valence electron rule and how uh, they come about uh, in transition metal complexes. So, with this I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and let us look forward to the next lecture where we are going to look at the classifications of 18 valence electron uh, 
uh, rule based principles in various organometallic compounds. Thank you.